Magnetic survey coverage continues to expand rapidly worldwide, but the ability to assimilate this data into exploration programs has not kept pace. Southern Geoscience, a global leader in integrating geophysical knowledge, will be offering their Integration of Aeromagnetic and Geology course ahead of the 2023 PDAC conference. This introductory and hands-on course aims to enlighten participants on the strengths and weaknesses of potential field methods and to illustrate how they can best be used to advance exploration programs. The course will run in person in Toronto on the 2nd and 3rd of March 2023. For more information or to register, go to sgc.com.au that's sgc.com.au or follow them on LinkedIn. Early bird rates apply until the end of January. Our guest on this episode of Exploration Radio is Sonia Scarcelli. Vice President of the BHP Explore Program. I'm your host, Ahmad. Come join us and let's explore. Resources are fundamental to the way we live now and in the future. With the increased electrification of energy and transport, the demand of commodities like copper will likely double in the next 30 years. Similarly, the demand for nickel will surge as the trend towards electric vehicles increases. The time is now to accelerate the exploration of resources we need now and into the future. BHP Explore has developed a cohort-based program that is committed to discovering the critical minerals that are needed for the world's future. We are looking for startups that are in the early exploration stages of the value chain, specifically focused on finding new resources. We will offer candidates in-kind services, mentorship and networking opportunities with industry and investors. Through this program, BHP Explore hopes to create disruptive results in minerals exploration by identifying new concepts, leveraging new data and testing opportunities at a much faster pace than discoveries to date. At BHP Explore, we believe that building a better future is a responsibility we all share and that is why we are committed to accelerating exploration of minerals needed for the energy transition. Apply now and together we can build a better future. For more information, visit bhp.com forward slash explore. Welcome to Expression Radio, Sonia. Good morning. Thank you so much. Before we get into kind of talking about the, the reason why you're on our podcast, which is the BHP Explore program, do you want to just give like you know, a minute, two minute introduction to yourself and how you got to where you are right now? So I'm Sonia Scarcelli and uh, I am uh, VP of uh, MVP for BHP Explore program. Uh, been in the, o- in the oil and gas industry actually previously for the past 20 years almost. Uh, and a year ago, we sold a BHP our oil and gas business uh, and I passed to the dark side of minerals. Uh, and that's how I ended up into the BHP Explore program. Uh, my background is in geology. So I have a PhD from uh, ETH in Zurich. Uh, and uh, during my uh, period in Axon, I also had the, the opportunity to, to do an MBA at London Business School, uh, which was really helpful for uh, most of my career, given I had several commercial and leadership roles. I'm actually Italian, so my accent probably give it away. And I actually, I left Italy 20 five years ago so I've been uh, outside in several countries for quite a long time and currently I'm, I'm in your son for the next couple of months before I move into Toronto but yes yeah, so today where I am I am I'm running a BHP Explorer which is corporate accelerator I started it uh, I created I created it launched it and now we're up and running so how did the program come about or why did the program come about the program came about from a, an initial request from our CEO where put forward a task to his entire leadership team which was uh, around the growth so a year ago, he sat down with his team and he asked his leadership team, what are uh, the venue that we can create uh, growth for the organization uh, in a more sustainable way and different from what we're done down? And the context uh, for him was really uh, the change uh, on the macro landscape. 
there is a much higher demand, uh, there is a much higher request for supply for critical mineral resources. Uh, we haven't really changed uh, our way of uh, finding, uh, developing and producing resources. So the two things really were not going together. And on his mind, we need to give uh, a little bit of a shake uh, to the to the way to, to the organization and so amongst the various ideas uh, my boss Johan he came forward with uh, why we don't create some sort of fund uh, to fund uh, ex- other companies uh, external companies and startups uh, to really expand our growth uh, space uh, our, our search space so that's how the idea came and then from that uh, um, I at the time, it was when we were selling petroleum. So I got asked if I was interested. I spent a little bit of time to think about what that would look like. I thought it was a great idea. And that's how we are here today. A bit of a tangential question I have is, it seems to be that now a lot of major mining companies are kind of starting these corporate venture funds or you know, like or uh, accelerator programs. You know, wh- why is that the case now? So from an accelerator point of view, from what I'm aware, uh, we are the only one running a true accelerator for a mineral exploration. And uh, although there are some other companies that are looking at incubator for technologies, uh, Venture fund, I know most of the major, they've now created a venture fund pillar. The venture fund pillar, they're operating uh, at, on, on opportunities. They're a little bit more mature than where we are with Explorer. We really are pre-seed type of opportunity and pre-IPO for a more uh, junior uh, nomenclature. Venture are looking at something that is more mature, uh, that has been already the risk uh, and tend to, to need to be uh, upscaling. So what I think is driving uh, the change uh, is uh, the macro context. Uh, the macro context uh, of the industry that has been uh, very stable uh, with uh, not very massive uh, growth uh, for quite a long time. And now we're looking at... Uh, massive growth that is required and what happened growth is going faster than how we've been able to adapt to it and so to adapt to that growth pace we we can't do the same thing that we have done for the past 50 years we need to think alternative solution the other part also the the industry has a need to be modernized whether it's through new technology through innovation so this is the best time because the the external market is asking for it and there is a big driver and, and the companies realize that there is the need to adapt so you talk about kind of the macro uh you know like macroeconomic or macro effects that are affecting this do you care to comment that are we at the current situation because there's been a lack of ideas or has it been a lack of the application or I guess the the conversion of, of those ideas into something. Yeah, like like in your opinion, what's what's been kind of the issue? Uh, have we been bereft of ideas or have we been bereft of people to do something with the idea or the money to do something to convert the ideas or whatever it is? All of the trees. So it's a little bit of looking at the past 10, 15 years and then going forward to what is the, the next uh, 10 to 20 years. In the past few years, the demand hasn't really grown significantly for many of the critical resources. Uh, apart, uh, whether it's a copper and nickel, has been very stable uh, because there wasn't like a, a new need. So that, that is one aspect. And what has been, uh, the, especially the, the front end uh, of the life cycle of the commodities, uh, has been very cyclical. And on the low cycle, uh, getting investment uh, is virtually impossible. Also, a lot of the investment uh, have been, uh, I call them uh, the trade mill uh, of the exploration investment. Uh, so you have juniors that uh, come with an idea, they can raise a little bit of capital to go and do minimum tests. Then they find something, they go back and there is a little bit more capital. And it's all uh, in general, uh, family offices, uh, friends and family, small venture. They, they are not getting uh, large capital. So it takes forever. It takes like five to six years to do what could be done in one year, just because how the, the market uh, raised the funds. So that, that has been an uh, uh, issue on, on in the industry. But also, when you look at the type of ideas that they get funded, uh, they are the usual suspect, uh, like I like to call it. So their ideas, are they, they are not new. There is no breakthrough. So normally they get, who get to get the money, the funds are... Uh, uh, already experienced uh, exploration leaders. They are well known to the market. Uh, and also the ideas that they're bringing forward, uh, they don't have anything that has uh, uh, 
a breakthrough concept uh, or a little bit more higher risk. And when I say higher risk, I mean uh, technical, uh, geological risk. Uh, they don't uh, they don't get to ten funded. Uh, what get to ten funded is uh, what uh, uh, is already well known. So that has created a little bit of a stagnation uh, on uh, new new concept. One of the things that you kind of talked about is, I guess, the investment in ideas and what gets funded and what doesn't get funded. Uh, yeah, like, and, and I guess. Yeah, like most people in the industry are, are quite aware that for probably for the last decade, I'd say there's been a little bit of a uh, a lack of faith in kind of funding a lot of things in, in mineral exploration. Isn't part of that problem because mineral exploration hasn't been a great investment for a lot of people? Yeah, you know, like it hasn't quite quite returned what, what people wanted. And then hence there's been this pulling back of investment into, you know, other kind of risk. Uh, or riskier kind of investments like yeah, cryptocurrencies or you know marijuana startups or like the craze a couple of years ago, and then yeah, you know, like that that all that risk capital kind of moves somewhere else. So isn't part of the problem that the industry hasn't been good at returning uh, for that investment? I think so. Look, I um I haven't gone back and done a proper uh, evaluation of return uh, and value created uh, in terms of numbers. I didn't really look how much we spent as an industry in twenty years uh, and what is the value created. But I'm gonna talk in terms of statistic and from a, a statistic point of view in the past 20 years uh, we had a lot of discoveries uh, but we haven't had any commercial discovery that uh, translated uh, into the development of a large mine there's been pr- developmental mines but they're all a very small scale uh, small scale low grade uh, and partly because uh, we haven't had uh, any new application of, of new concept or new idea, new technology in the past 20 years. So we're doing the mineral exploration today like we've been doing that 30 years ago. And uh, and we're also going to the same place that we used to go 30 years ago. So there hasn't been a change of thinking. You have an experience from, from the other side, which we consider the dark side, which is the oil and gas. But yes, yeah, so, so how like how was it different in oil and gas? Did the oil and gas industry hit the same kind of wall at some point? And did they have to change how they how they had to yes, do Yes, absolutely. Um, so 30 years ago, oil and gas uh, hit the wall of lack of investment on the front end with an increase on demand and growth. So they needed to bring new resources. They were low low on the cost curve to the market. And the exploration has been extremely unsuccessful for a long time. So they, they hit the wall and the industry reacted to that moment as an industry. So they came together as an industry and, and they changed two things. A lot of people say they changed technology, but the, the technology changed as a... Um, reflection and a need of a problem and they were trying to solve so at the time the industry focused on understanding how the petroleum system work so how holistically the petroleum system work and how we can the risk elements of that petroleum system so that's what really was the, the critical change and not the technology per se but really changing to this concept of petroleum system which is what we are trying to drive today with the mineral system and they did that very well and they could uh, summarize the petroleum system in five elements and so now is uh, what are the technology that we need uh, to the risk uh, each of these uh, five elements and that's a uh, the, the, what they realized was uh, of these five elements, uh, actually seismic, uh, can they risk it four out of five? And so that's where they invested a lot on a 3D seismic uh, from an image point of view, migration story, uh, uh, basin evolution. And they also changed this concept uh, from uh, they were not looking anymore for the trap uh, and from, from the small scale uh, large they were looking from the big picture down to the trap. So again, with this petroleum system, then they, they developed the 3D seismic, which became a massive enabler. And that has increased quite a bit the, the exploration chance of success. So we had the much larger discoveries as enabled all the deep water exploration and the pre-salt exploration. And we've seen all the next generation of discoveries uh, in uh, Gulf of Mexico, Angola, Nigeria, and so on. And I think that where the mineral, is, the mineral industry is today is where oil and gas was. And so we need to better understand what's the mineral system that we have in front of us and now how we can define and find the technology so they can help to the risk, the elements 
of the mineral system. So the major, I guess, phase shift in oil and gas was more the idea revolution more than the technology revolution. Do you think that's kind of where we sit in, in exploration right now? That you know, it's not necessarily... You know, like perhaps we need some technological innovation, but we probably need far more idea innovation before we get there. It goes uh, together and you need both. Uh, what you can't do, you can't have a technology applied uh, blindly because it's a good technology. Because you always have to ask the question, uh, what are we trying to solve for? Uh, and think about what is the, the critical problem uh, or the critical unknown that you need to solve for. Once you answer that question, uh, then you can think about what's the best technology that is going to help me to solve that problem. So one other thing I guess I wanted to kind of talk about is what you mentioned around the accelerator program. I guess one of the things I found about why there there was this uh, perhaps um, laggard technological evolution or or uh, idea evolution in in mineral exploration is as compared to say you know like um, let's look at uh, technology startups you know like uh, or software startups or something like that yeah you know, like I guess it costs far less to do a proof of concept in a software space than it ever did in, in mineral exploration space you know like we're talking about millions of dollars or at the very least hundreds of thousands of dollars to kind of uh, do an effective test of ideas whereas yeah you know, like my brother works as a software engineer yeah you know, he's probably on his like twentieth company because cost him like $10,000 or like $5,000 to kind of test a concept and then and, and kind of do it. And so, yeah, so do you think that's been a barrier in, uh, in the fact that, you know, like in, in exploration, particularly in, in mineral exploration, we can come up with ideas, but the minimum threshold to kind of viably test it is, is quite high compared to, say, other industries? Definitely. The capital requirement uh, to test uh, exploration ideas is uh, significantly higher than the capital requirement uh, for uh, technology. Also, Running an accelerator uh, on exploration startup uh, requires uh, capabilities that uh, they are really pertinent to the industry. So you are not gonna get uh, anybody familiar with uh, uh, how you do an oper- operation and how you go to the field. How actually, it's not even just the operation. There is a lot of work that needs to be done from a, a regulatory approval. There is a uh, above ground work that needs to be completed. There is. Uh, licensing the area so where you're going to go and do your tests so it's a much more complex activity than running a software you can run you can build a software truly out of your garage you cannot do an exploration campaign out of your garage not even a garage like yeah like you could do it on a laptop yeah like you could do it like most of it sits in the cloud you could do it off an ipad if you wanted but yeah like mineral exploration there's a lot more a lot more that has to happen a lot more complexity and uh, and to be fairly honest, when uh, when we started with the program, we, there wasn't a market to step in where you you actually are already entering an existing market and you just have to be better than the others to capture uh, customers. We had to create the market. And so I've been uh, taking this project from a two months, two months. Like the first two months is, okay, can we do it? Yes, we can do it. And then enter on the market. Let, can, can we launch it effectively? Let's launch it effectively. And then are we going to get customers? Uh, so now we got a lot of good responses. So we have created the market. So it's been like really two months to two months, a baby step. And because uh, we didn't know if it was going to be successful. Uh, what does success look like to you in this program? I mean, what like you know, like what would you qualify as success out of this program? That's a, it's a very great question. And uh, success is going to be for this uh, program uh, changing uh, through time. This is the first year we are running, uh, and so my, uh, my my main criteria for success uh, are. Uh, First of all, uh, are we going to be able uh, to get uh, quality candidates? So that is uh, one metric. So really raise uh, enough uh, um, um, awareness that we're getting application in and those applications are good. So that was the first. The the second piece is uh, the companies, uh, at least for the first year, in three year times, the metric of success will be looking different. So what's your KPI in the program? Is it a financial one? Is it a strategic one? I guess it sounds a little bit more strategic than just purely, you know, like you don't, like, like you got to, you got to put a dollar in and get a dollar fifty back. Like it doesn't sound like that's the type of program that you're trying to go with. It's a strategic, uh, both from uh, an idea generation, uh, getting a much bigger uh, 
footprint, uh, uh, global footprint of uh, what is possible out there. Uh, it is the marketing uh, of being out there uh, and, uh, and and creating more awareness of what BHP does. Uh, um, so it's, an, it's entirely strategic. And the reason why I say that uh, is that uh, exploration per se does not create uh, revenue if you are familiar with any other type of industry whether it's pharmaceutical or technologies R&D type so there is a revenue but is a you you basically uh, see the revenue later on when the opportunity is already gone from exploration success uh, to development and then production the revenue actually happening on the production it never happened on the exploration uh, Phase. So in 10 year time, you can see how much value is being created from a financial point of view, but not today. So that's why um, for me, financial metrics, uh, you can think about what could look like in the future and you should, but it's hard to year on year to define uh, these opportunities giving me this year, this amount of return. Let's be honest, if, if you ran a year on year kind of return program for like R&D, you, you'd go broke pretty quickly or, or you probably wouldn't start, right? Like that, let's That's be exactly honest. That's exactly right. So, but that was the c- similar in oil and gas. So what you're looking is, uh, is what could look like, what is the upside, the potential and a success case of that opportunity, what would look like, uh, is it commercial? And commercial is a very loose term for me because the commerciality threshold uh, change from company to company and they're really based on the size of the company and there are so many factors that determine that, what's discount rate you're apply, what country premium you're apply and, and each company does that differently. That's why I'm saying that, uh, is a very loose term of what commerciality is. Uh, it might be meaning something at BHP that is completely different to someone else. So what were, like, what are some lessons from the oil and gas journey in this space that we could actually adopt? I mean, like, you know, like what were some challenges they ran into or what failures did they have when, when they went down this path? I think the, the failure uh, on the oil and gas uh, um, has been uh, in, not, not in all companies and not in all uh, instances, uh, but if you think about the last 20 years, uh, what we saw 20 years ago in oil and gas was a lot of success um, and a lot of discoveries, uh, and that uh, also came into a period uh, of increase of the oil and gas price. Uh, and that's uh, what it brought. It was a lot of uh, capital uh, and discipline. So we saw a lot of uh, wasted capital on everything. So they lost a little bit the this uh, clear focus on a petroleum system and understand and focusing only on the opportunity that could actually really work from a scale point of view. The actually the success rate. Uh, we don't do that in in mining at all, Sonia. It's like you know, capital inefficiency doesn't come into this industry uh, at all. Yeah. So, but that is the risk. So the things things that the the market right now has a very high commodity price and. Uh, we started to invest on everything and then the success rate goes down because that's what happened in oil and gas. The amount of uh, opportunity tested increased and the amount of success rate went down significantly. And that's because they were uh, investing on everything. So that uh, clear focus and capital discipline can't change. It does not matter what's the commodity price. You need to really maintain a focus on what you're test- what you're working on. Because uh, as soon as uh, the success rate keeps going down, then uh, the response from the market is uh, exploration is not delivering and therefore we're not investing. And then we're finding ourselves another cycle of lack of investment. Kind of like a catch-22, right? That, uh, yeah, like if you are true about, if you're, you know, if you're really honest and really true about trying to test as many ideas as possible, you probably have to accept that there's going to be some inefficiency, right? Because at, at the early stage, all ideas look really good. Like, you know, you have no idea what looks good and what looks bad or, or, or whatever. And so, so, you, so you have to be okay to some degree about some level of inefficiency in any accelerator program because that's kind of by definition how an accelerator program should run. Yes, are you comfortable with that? Yeah, I, I am. Uh, and uh, I agree and disagree with you. I don't think that all ideas look good. Yeah, okay. I, I think that there are ideas and ideas and... Uh, it goes back when we talked about the petroleum system, understanding how the petroleum system works. There are ideas uh, that I have already seen through the application that there is a very deep uh, thinking around the mineral system. They might not work. I am very comfortable that we go and test that they don't work, but we will learn a lot. We will learn a lot in terms of how the mineral system works. 
And so that is one one uh, item. And the other thing is uh, we're gonna go and test uh, the critical elements uh, to actually fail fast. So we're not gonna spend 20 million before defining uh, the failure. We're gonna spend much less and just focus on the critical element. Uh, I think that will give us the learning that we need uh, to, as from a long from a bigger picture point of view, to actually de- increase the success rate. And uh, I do take, I find to me, I'm not um, so success rate uh, in terms of how many of these opportunity will work uh, is not my key KPI. But I guess the question is like you know like how do you know when is the right time to, to stop? Yeah, like like I mean one of the things I find is like people say fail fast. What if it's going to take you like ten steps to get to like you know let's say it's going to take you ten steps to get to your uh, like outcome? Yeah, like you fail on the first one, is that a good time to stop? Is it like you know fail on the second one, is that a good time to stop? Yeah, like what What if you get to the ninth step and you stop and the 10th one was the best one? So that's one of the, I guess, the challenges I find is that like, yeah, like how do you know when is the appropriate time to sometimes walk away from things as well? So that's where uh, it goes back in my mind to really develop a clear understanding of mineral system. I think we have the 10th step because we don't understand how the system works. And so we go and test uh, a lot of things, but I'm not sure what we are testing are the right things. True. That's so that's point. what I want to step back uh, and work on. Uh, what's the clear mineral system? And it might not be the first test. It might be the second test, but it can't be 10 because the 10 to me is like a... Um, it's just testing the blind. You just go and try everything. It's, it's a shotgun pattern, right? You're, you're testing everything. Exactly. And to me, we also... What I see, we all, we start from an observation on the field, and we expand from that observation. I want to change that. When we think about mineral system, we need to start with the geologic evolution, so from the bigger picture to the the small scale, and then how best we can go and figure out where to test it. And if it doesn't work on that place, it should not work everywhere else. So that is what I want to challenge. And maybe it's not a test; maybe it's a couple. But it can be ten. Yeah, like I spent quite a, like a lot of time kind of uh, looking at venture capital uh, firms. Like you know, same thing where, and and I think that you know like that's something that they like the most successful ones I think have done really well is that they either condense all of their like I guess everything that they're interested in very small buckets and they go like you know we're going to look for a good team or the or, or the right team and we don't really care about the product what it looks like and we'll care about the like the the best team and the best market fit and that's it. You know, like we don't care what the product is. Because because the right team can actually make the product work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's other people that just go uh, completely the other way, where they go, you know, like, we are going to fund as many things as we can, and then and, and we accept that as long as it's a low amount, you know, like, we're going to, we're going to take as many bets as possible and then maybe some of them will work out. Um, so I'm always interested in like, you know, like how you kind of navigate that that aspect. Like, you know, like because at one point you, you probably have to do one or the other. You know, like you either got to play the probability game or you got to, you know, figure out what you're saying is like, you know, figure out some key metrics and say, you know what, we're going to back these metrics because this is what we think are the best things to put our money into or, or, or our money behind or things like that. Actually, I do I have a different option for you because we're, looking at this quite differently so first of all uh, the program is managed from a portfolio point of view so i'm not uh, looking at an individual risk or an individual company i'm looking at a, a portfolio fit and the portfolio fit as uh, different metrics as a, a risk matrix or chance of success of at least one happening it, it does have a, a geographic distribution from areas that are uh, easy entry no problem to areas that are a little bit more uh, uh, above ground uh, uh, challenged. So we wanted to have uh, some sort of balance there. So to me, is one that has to work within the portfolio. That is already slightly different. But from a company individual point of view, I cannot just look at the leadership and hoping that one day they have a good idea. I can't do that. I need to have at least three dimensional uh, metrics, which one is... Uh, the, the, the concept uh, is the technical concept uh, as some uh, interesting uh, hypothesis uh, 
and maybe no observation, but there is quite a lot of deduction there. And so we now need to go and test it in the field. And so from, from that point of view, so I'm looking at the type of uh, metrics. Then from uh, the, um, the leadership team, it is, is this a new leadership team? Is this a mature leadership team? Um, how we are going to work with them and what do they need to really uh, be up and running? And the third one is around uh, geography. Is where is this located? What, where, uh, what, uh, how the, what is going to be the challenge from a, an above ground point of view? So I need to look all the three. I can't just uh, look separately because all the three will uh, will require a different type of support. And and so and are you okay with uh, with the fact that uh, you might have to change these metrics? Like you know, say year two, year three, you might have to come up with completely different metrics and and things like that. Like is is that as as part of your brief? Yeah. You, you, yeah? Okay. It has it has because uh, we, I'm. We've been learning so much in the past few months and we'll be learning from the people that we've been talking to in the market. What are the needs? Uh, what is the thinking out there? Who are, who are the players? Once we bring people in the program, we learn even more on how to run the program. And, uh, and maybe next year, uh, we will realize that we need to be focused geographically. And so we need to change one of the metrics or we need to be focused commodity-wise. The things will change and we learn what we need to do we just need to be flexible we can't be in love uh, with the initial idea and ever uh, change it so i think that's uh, it's going to be key for the program to remain successful so in an ideal world yeah like it looks like what you're trying to build is kind of it's somewhat similar to i guess an open innovation kind of program yeah there's a, there's a few companies that have tried these i think like you know like ge was like a really good one uh, where you know like they realized at one point that uh, actually you know, like for example, uh, yeah, like when they were a small company, yeah, you know, they could come up with an idea that could have a material effect on 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 the company uh, because they were only a billion dollar company, and they could easily come up with an idea that could create a hundred million dollars. But when they became you know a multi billion dollar company, they got to a point where they went, well, actually, you know, like now we need to have an idea that's going to create five or ten billion dollars, and and those and those ideas were very rare, and so we could never have all of those ideas sit inside the company. There would always be more of these ideas sitting outside the company. So, so yeah. So, G kind of realized that actually our best value is in actually taking ideas through kind of the development cycle, you know, the manufacturing and all, all of that kind of idea. And so, you know, so that to me sounds like very similar in what you guys are trying to do. In that, you know, there's 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 people that have ideas, but they're not the best people in in kind of doing something with that idea. You know, there's kind of the doer and the thinker. Yeah, you know? there's people that might be really good at kind of thinking up ideas. And let's take academics. Like, yeah, you know, there's great ideas that come out of academia, but academics aren't the best people to go and kind of do something with. Yeah, you know, they're, they're just not motivated that way. They're not incentivized that way. And so, yeah, so is that like really what, what you would think would be like one of the best outcomes for you is that you kind of get these ideas and then, you know, like BHP as an organization is great at kind of taking ideas through that through that cycle and you can kind of take them through that path? Yeah, so definitely part of that uh, is that uh, so we, we're going to just uh, open up uh, our search space uh, to a much uh, diverse pool of uh, idea generators. Um, but also there is a component of cross-pollination. Uh, we do have uh, our own exploration team and this offers an opportunity to everybody internally also to, to get exposed on what is out there. And also think about, okay, this is a great idea. What if uh, I can apply to one of my existing uh, areas? Uh, can it work? Uh, so there is uh, this opportunity of learning from externally. And um, the, the best example, of, you bring up GE, but to me, the closest example is a pharmaceutical. A lot of uh, pharmaceutical companies, uh, they have accelerators uh, programs, and they also have their own internal R&D team. And so they're really good in developing uh, some of their internal ideas. They're very really successful, but they normally, when they develop in talent, they already focus uh, on uh, cri financial criteria and metrics so they can fit uh, with their portfolio. So a lot of uh, the very early stage, uh, high risk idea, they don't even get considered because uh, they think that it might not fit with the portfolio, but they do through the accelerator. Uh, and that's allow them to see more concept early on and think about if some can come back to their system. So that's uh, to me is uh, one of the closest analogy. 
again, I think exploration and R&D are just very similar. Yeah, I mean, I think if there's one industry that's probably very similar to mineral exploration, it's the the, the pharmaceutical side, you know, the drug development side. Yeah, even, even from like a capital... I guess capital requirement point of view and the regulatory, you know, they have regulatory, we have permits, you know, so it's very, very similar in how it's gonna kinda like what what life cycle an idea actually has to go through. So so I think that's a very appropriate example. And so um so so you mentioned one thing about that, yeah, you know, like when you're kind of dealing with ideas and uh, yeah, I guess in the reading that I did around open innovation kind of programs, you know, like one of the challenges they had very early on was around essentially around IP, like how like, you know, like how IP would get shared around. Um, and so, yeah, so have you guys thought about, uh, you know, like that aspect? Uh, because I guess, you know, like one of the things that I find is that when you are a startup, you know, like all your value is really in your idea, really, before you've kind of done a proof of concept or done anything. And so you become very protective of that idea as well. So, so you know, so how, how do you, how do you feel you're going to access that in, in PHP Explorer? I think this is a very good question. Uh, and uh, a lot of that, uh, it is really through the contract that we are putting in place. Uh, so there, this is very clear language. Uh, if it is a, an a IP from a technology point of view, we are not interested. That uh, We are Explorer is not on the business uh, to get patents uh, on technologies. Uh, that's not our uh, business model. Uh, we are more than happy to leave the technology to the company that's created it. Uh, we will want to utilize uh, the technology during the period that the company is with us. Uh, if we are developing together some tool, uh, we would like to utilize it in the future, but the company owns that tool. Uh, it's their baby. We don't want it. Um, in terms of idea, so ideas from a, a scientific point of view, like a specific idea on a region, we in the contract, we have a, um, what we call the area of interest, mutual interest that will be defined with each of the company. And so we, we want to make sure that uh, there is an agreement that we cannot go on that area for a period uh, and, and take the idea. That's uh, that we can't do. That uh, is, again, uh, the company idea. So we want to be mindful and respectful. Uh, and that is, a, is an agreement that we'll put in place with each of the companies because it will look different uh, from company to company. If it is uh, an idea of uh, a new mineral system concept, uh, once we test it in the field uh, with the company, as you can imagine, it becomes a public domain. That uh, is, is not like a patent uh, on a chemical uh, uh, development or a process. Uh, so those basically, everybody, everybody knows, including myself coming from academia, that that become public available. So I think everybody will be able to apply that concept uh, globally if they want to so that's uh, that's to me um it's uh, it's awareness that we all have including the companies that have been talking with us mm -hmm. and so, so do you think there's a a risk in the fact that if you go down this path where you know like if someone gives you their idea and you guys test it and it becomes public you know do you think there's a risk in that people may not come to this program because they may not want their idea to go public at some point you know they, they would want to keep it private Let's define what you mean for idea. I'll ask a question to you. What, what do you mean for idea? Can, can you make an example to me? So then I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm answering to the right question. So say you have an idea about a, a, a new type of, say, uh, deposit style that you might want to test. All right, but but you don't have. Uh, I guess if you're a startup, you know you don't have either the the money or you don't have the backing to kind of get it to a proof of concept. And so when I look at a program like BHP Explorer, I go, well, actually, the best use of that program would be to kind of do those proof of concept tests. If I do it with a with a public company, and you like you obviously have to report you're under a re regulatory environment that you have to report certain things. Um, then I yeah like the by the very nature of taking it through a proof of concept, if it becomes public, then I've kind of lost my ability to keep it proprietary to some degree. So how do I actually ma manage that that aspect in that, um, you know, like, you know, like a, yeah, like to some degree, I'm kind of selling you milk, but you're kind of getting the store at the same time. So, uh, you yeah, know, so that, that's a risk to me as a startup at that stage. So I'll make you an example on what I think an idea is, because I don't think it's clear. So let's say I'll, I'll take oil and gas. OK, so an idea on oil and gas that came a few years ago was and it was coming from academia and it was coming through a consortium of 
20 companies. Uh, so, but it was still a, a proprietary idea. So the concept was that uh, in deep water, you in a passive margin in deep water, uh, you actually have a, a development uh, of the, the cluster architecture uh, in such a way that uh, there are areas that are more prone for uh, hydrocarbon accumulation. And there are areas that uh, you never see hydrocarbon accumulation because there is a time lag uh, between a source rock deposition uh, and, uh, and, and, and evolution of the basin. So that, that, that is a, a, an idea that I'm thinking. So someone comes in and say, well, this basin actually has evolved in this way and this pulse. So my observation is that I, I believe that to find the large accumulation, you need to go where you find this type of deposit. Okay, so that's, that's the idea. And the startup is gonna come and say, we're gonna fo- we're gonna focus on this uh, small uh, geographic region to go and test it. That is the proof of concept. Uh, there is a during the program exclusivity. We're not gonna go and grab land uh, in that area. That is not because we don't want to to take that away from the startup. Now we go with the startup. We test the concept. The concept is uh, successful. Uh, it's not BHP that makes a, a public uh, speech. It's the startup itself that goes uh, for raising a further capital uh, to talk about uh, that is the success uh, and, uh, and that's what it looks like. They might not go into the detail of the idea, but at that point, uh, it's public. Uh, it's public and everybody can come and say, oh, that is a great concept. Uh, I've seen similar geology in the other side of the world. Uh, let me go and test it. Uh, so that's, that's to me, you can't IP that. Uh, you can't. No, no, no. That's right. But, but, but let's take that. Uh, let, let's take that forward, right? So, uh, so, so you, so you have uh, worked with a startup, and you have restrictions on one geographical area, which relates to one passive margin. Now, what happens in another passive margin? Does that startup get a right to exclusivity in that passive margin? No, you can't. I mean, you can't do anywhere because, again. That is the concept of AOI. That's a, is a how it works in oil and gas industry. That's how it's working in mineral. That is not an IP by definition. You can, you can apply any public concept. Everybody, not BHP, any car, Rio Tinto can see it and can go and apply it. Yep. So that I, no, no, no. And I, and I understand that. I mean, I guess, yeah, like one of the things, uh, yeah, like obviously you guys are doing an accelerator program, so it's slightly different. But, you know, there's a lot of companies that, that, that have run... Um, you know, like crowdsourcing competitions or, 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 or like, you know, open source kind of competitions. And yeah, like one of the things I guess that's that's held them back is that it's not clear what happens after the program. Yeah, like, like yeah, like who, who does the actually, uh, the IP actually lie with? Yeah, like if, like, yeah, like I, I, am I kind of giving it to you? And then, yeah, like once the proof of concept's done, now there's something valuable, but but is, does it get returned back to me? Or, or you know, or, or do I get a share of that in perpetuity? Or like what happens from that point? And so a lot of people aren't willing to kind of put their ideas in because they don't quite understand exactly what, you know, like what the framework looks like after that step or after the kind of the program. And I think that's a restriction that's always present, uh, always not presented, always prevented people from kind of getting involved in things like this. Yes, I know, because also to test their idea, they need to get involved into things like this. So there is a... a yeah, I mean, there is. There and I think this is where I think your this is uh, sorry to say, like I think this is where your program is good, is because you know like, you're kind of going pre seed, right? So like yeah, you know, so the so the the interest is on the person going well. Yeah, if you can get this funding through any other means, you probably would have. But yeah, but if your idea is is this idea that you really need kind of the the help, the financial as well as the uh, the mentoring and all the other aspects that you kind of added in, then yeah, like then this is. The, it's a program in the true accelerator sense. And if you think about uh, once a day, let's say they, they come to the program and uh, they get the finance and they go and test their ideas uh, in the field, uh, we are not taking that over from the company. I mean, we, we, have, uh, we have other mechanisms that we would want to, to make sure we can retain something of it. Uh, but the mechanism is not that now it starts. It's not. It remains with the company. We might look at a convertible that we get uh, equity on the opportunity or we get equity on the company, but we are not uh, taking it over. The company will remain as a standalone. Our, uh, our goal is not to take all this company inside BHP. 
that's never been our goal. Yeah, like we can cut this out later, but can I challenge you on that point? Because I looked at your T's and C's of the program, and I want to read you one one clause. So intellectual property rights and derivatives, in order to evaluate the application as contemplated, BHP may upload the primary data you provide into its geological database and other analysis software or platforms. A BHP shall own all right, title, and interest in all intellectual property rights in the derivatives, including any improvements to its internal database and software resulting from the data. So, you know, so what, doesn't that mean that you will own own that stuff as well? The, the, the derivative, like uh, if we have uh, developed, uh, I don't know, a plot uh, or a map uh, that I put in context uh, that 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 opportunity into a global regional context. Uh, yes, uh, that derivative. Uh, but not the data per se. The data are all going to be deleted by from our system. So we're not going to be able to use the data in the future. So what it means is uh, if uh, I change uh, my concept, uh, my mineral system concept, uh, I won't have the data anymore to go and update that model. Uh, it's just really temporary at the moment. Uh, and we need to do that. And the reason why we need to do that is uh, I... Uh, if I can't put, put the data in context of a geological frame of reference, then I, I, don't, I don't do anything with the data to evaluate that opportunity. That's really what it is. Do you think there's a risk like, you know, so if I read a clause like that, to me, sometimes it, like, you know, like I could interpret that as an IP grab, because if you are doing things that I'm doing as well, like, for example, like, yeah, like, uh, like I have a data mining uh, startup. Yeah. So, so I'm doing stuff where we're, we're doing data mining. Now, if BHP has done anything in data mining and I kind of uh, get involved with you and you involve my data mining algorithms to yours, then you know, your product gets better, but I'm no better because I don't have your product. So, so yeah. So, isn't so if your if your product gets better through mine, then shouldn't we share that, or or should I get my stuff back and you shouldn't have a right to it afterwards? Uh, I don't think my program will get better through that. Actually, again, the way the pro the the data we are going to be used, they're going to be used to evaluate the concept, not for creating a, a different product at BHP. So that's not the the intent. The other thing is uh, data becomes available uh, after a certain period anyway, and anyhow. So there isn't, uh, you don't have a um, permanent proprietary on data. The other thing is uh, um, your uh, your technology and your product, uh, by definition, gets better eh? as well because you're going to work with us. We are going to be helping you to put that uh, idea into a frame of reference. That's, by definition, improve your product as well, not just us. And, yeah, but I... and then we are, we are going to go and pay for uh, you to get more data and tests that actually are going to benefit as well. So I think no, no, no. it's, and, uh, it's and, a mutual benefit. And, uh, my point, yeah, I guess my point is not in saying that, like, you know, like there's no benefits coming this way. My point, is, I guess, in saying is, yeah, like when, when I kind of ask around, uh, yeah, like, I, like I've participated in open source competitions and I've even wanted to do it with people that, that, that were quite good in, in their field. And, and one of the restrictions that come from is that, you know, they go, well, yeah, like, to me, uh, there's no, uh, yeah, obviously, there's a financial benefit that I could get as a one-off hit. Uh, but, you know, like I could get the same financial benefit from five different clients by working for them. So, so you know, so, so what, what is my incentive in kind of, you know, like passing my IP over? And yes, I get some benefits, but but I don't get, uh, you know, I get the same benefit over a slightly longer period. So, so there's always this in- incentive gap, and and I think and I think this is something that that probably uh, like restricts a lot of these kind of programs is because uh, like often the end is not not very clear on yeah you know, like do I get my stuff back if it didn't work or yeah you know, like or, or or do you get to keep some of it or or do we get do we stay involved in some way or uh, you know so what does the outcome actually look like are we, are we really clear on it or or is it still kind of iffy because as a startup you know that's a risk for me for for being involved in a big company is that yeah you know, like I could lose the shirt off my back and I have no way of getting it back because you know like you, you guys have you guys are a much bigger gorilla right like yeah like I, I can't really deal with you in in that sense we don't want to create uh, that certain type of animosity that's not the intent uh, data is not a data is not a really ip it's really hard to define data as ip but we're not keeping the data the data are all going back uh, and uh, while uh, people are benefiting while uh, we are going to use the data to understand the idea if the idea is a, a real idea they are going to benefit as well from uh, our uh, 
internal people from our mineral system thinking. Uh, so again, they are going to get enriched as well. Now, the exit points uh, are many. The, uh, the companies might not want to keep working with us. Uh, they might want to exit from the program and do something else with someone else. Uh, and, and they are free to do that. Uh, but they might actually want to maintain a relationship that uh, maybe that, uh, that idea is a failure, uh, but it can open up some, some other opportunities where BHP can come and participate to that. Uh, to be perfectly honest, uh, that's not, uh, it's very fair question you are making. It's not a question I've been asked, uh, actually, which is very interesting. I guess the reason why I asked this is because yeah, like when you kind of set up like, yeah, like if I went through kind of a, um, I don't want to say normal, but yeah, like a standard accelerator program, it's quite clear what, what I'm getting. Yeah, like I'm getting investment. Yeah, they don't want my idea. You know, what they want is X percentage equity, you know, that they, that they can have some liquidity and, and then do whatever they want with it. Uh, whereas I think these are a little bit more challenging, the type of program you're kind of setting up is because it's it's not necessarily just a pure investment kind of play. Yeah, you know, like there, there's an exchange of ideas where you're like, you know, like we can make your idea better. It's like, okay, well, yeah, you know, like so 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 at the start I have hundred percent of the idea. What happens like in the middle of the program? Is it 50 50? And what happens at the end? Do I get 10% and you get 90? Like, you know, like what what happens like through that point? And no, no, and, and I, I think I think, I think you're looking at this from a, as a an accelerator work as a standalone on the technology space. I, I told you this is not that ty- you can't compare it to this type of accelerator. These are not technologies where there is a very clear uh, IP, there is a very clear tool you are developing. So the one you have to really compare to is a pharmaceutical. So you go back to pharmaceutical and on the pharmaceutical space, that is exactly what's happening. It is a learning. It is a learning from both sides. And when there is a learning from both sides, some cases, some of those companies and ideas, they get eventually bought by the main company, but it takes years and it doesn't happen immediately. In some cases, they're just able to go and and go out uh, and sell their own product on their own uh, and become their own standalone. So that is a very similar concept here. For us, uh, <clears throat> there'll be a lot of uh, ideas and concepts that we are testing. I I can assume uh, and then maybe only like, uh, let's say we're taking 10 companies this year, maybe one on 10, it is something that we will want to, to go ahead uh, for future uh, investment, like in terms of uh, we wanted to be part of that opportunity and we wanted to own that opportunity. <clears throat> because a lot of the ideas we are looking as it stands today, they are so early stage, they're so high risk uh, that they, there is no visibility on how they could fit uh, within our portfolio in terms of size and scale. So you need to look at that as a uh, it is a mutual learning and improvement, but the companies are still, those companies are still own the idea. They still own their land. Their proprietary, it is within the land and the area they own and the area of interest that is defined in a case by case. Some places are very defined license. Some places are a little bit bigger because there is no license definition. They still own it. We can't go and take it from them. You can't put exclusivity on the world. You, I mean, you can't do that. No, no, no. no. And I, th- and I, mean, I think, like you know, like like I agree with you, right? You have to be realistic in that. Yeah, like you are a corporation. Like if you got a hundred people no, no. applying, it's and you not had because... restrictions like World War. It's not because we are a corporation. No, no, no. Like, like I mean, like like. <laughs> Like realistically, you can't, right? Like, yeah, like if you got like ten people and every one of them had restrictions worldwide, like, yeah, like your you, your legal department would have to be like a thousand people to figure out how all of these restrictions would apply and all of that stuff, right? Like, it's just not the reality of how how this would work. But it's not the reality how business work. And I can tell you, you are looking about the the startup. The startup can go. So let's take the idea. They finish the program. We have a, a, a mutual interest uh, that we both have a restriction, and especially us, we have a restriction for going and grabbing uh, things uh, in that area that does not involve the, the startup. At the end of the program, uh, that startup, uh, it is uh, welcome to go and sell that idea to everybody else. They can go to any other competitor and say, we work this at BHP and it worked in this area. We think, we think it can work in the other area. They can do that. I wanted to make sure that this is seen from both sides because we are not stopping them to do that. No, no, no. Yeah, like uh, I guess, yeah, 
I was kind of going back to kind of our earlier discussion around that if you wanted to, like if you were trying to set up an, an accelerator program that had to deal with kind of the development of ideas mutually through collaboration, which is which is what pharmaceuticals do, because I think that's the risk in these programs is that everyone wants to get in at the start, but then, you know, like at the end is really what matters because that's what people want to know is, you know, because the end, it, it, like effectively the end is binary, right? Either it works or it doesn't. And everyone knows what what the end looks like when it doesn't work. But, but what does it look like when it works? And 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 then like yeah, you know, like and and who gets what and how uh, how does it actually evolve from that point on? And yeah, so maybe I'll be clear on that. Uh, when the end uh, works, uh, we are not uh, going to own the end. Uh, we're gonna have a, a right to take some equity on it. But the company still own the startup still own the success. Uh, it's theirs. Uh, and that's uh, so what we put forward uh, on um, not uh, at the participation to the program, the participation to the program is only exclusivity that uh, we are ex- mutually exclusive to each other during the program. Then at the end of the program, there is the, the pitch day or shark tank, whatever you want to call it, where they raise a further capital with us. That's where we enter to a second uh, agreement. Uh, and that's as a, a convertible type of language. The convertible uh, needs to be decided uh, with the companies itself. And and for us, it's really important to do at that point because uh, I don't know if I want equity on a company and I don't know if I want equity on the opportunity. Some companies might have a very large portfolio, which I'm not interested. So I don't want equity on the company. Some companies has uh, one idea. So I'm actually interested now both either on the company or uh, on the idea but I'm not even going to get a majority. So we are not, uh, we put like a, 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 a roof that is like a 20%. We're not going to go beyond that. So the, so the company still uh, owns uh, the, the idea, still owns the success. And now if they come back to us and say, actually, we really want, really enjoy the working with BHP. It's been a, a great program. We actually know that uh, beyond the exploration, we don't have the capabilities uh, to bring uh, this uh, success force forward from a development uh, and production. That's why you need really the billions of uh, capital uh, and is a good fit for us. Uh, that's where uh, we can say, yes, we, we're more than happy to now become the operator. But that has to be the startup decision. We don't put a string attached to that. That is their, uh, their choice. I, have I explained myself a little bit better on what is the end here? I'm kind of pushing you on this because I think, like, yeah, like in, in my experience, just having talked to peers, this is what kind of like you know prevents people from I think getting involved in this. And and I and I appreciate that you know like every time these programs have been run, you know, crowdsourcing competitions or, or you know these type of accelerator programs or venture capital fund, you know, they get better because obviously you learn and you go, yeah, you know, like this this is what the market kind of wants. So if if you want to play in the market, you know, we gotta kinda set up these things. Uh, I'm also interested in what you kind of talked about, you know, the equity in the company versus the idea. Yeah. So so are there any other things that you found particularly challenging about trying to set up set up this program? Or yeah, you know, like things that that kept you up at night going, well, you know, like, do we fit it in or do we not fit it into the program? It's really to, to identify what's going to work um, um, on each of the company. It's going to be different and we'll have to decide at the moment. Uh, so if you go to a classic accelerator and I take a Y Combinator as an example, because that is a, the first and the most uh, used example, uh, the, it's very clear. Uh, everything that comes through, they're going to get, a, I think it's a 7% equity, no matter what. Yeah, like $150,000 or something they put in and 7%. Yeah, that's their yeah. standard so, kind of approach. Super standard. It works with everyone. Many are going to fail. Some are going to be successful. It doesn't matter. Very standard. They are set up for that. We, we can't do that. I don't want equity on all these companies. That is, We are not on the business to put together a portfolio of companies. And by the way, I don't also want to manage a portfolio that has a lot of failures because then it's hard to get out. Um, and in exploration, that's going to happen. Um, so it has, uh, we'll have to decide uh, for each of the companies. That's why we look at, at a convertible, but then we need to decide with the company itself what's going to be better. Because uh, putting uh, getting equity on an uh, exploration company uh, needs uh, to have a very clear understanding of their full portfolio. We are not going to have a clear understanding of the full portfolio. We're going to have a good, just an understanding of the opportunity they're bringing to explore. 
they might have other kind of opportunities. And I, th- I think that I think that's probably a pretty shrewd move because yeah, otherwise you, you like yeah, you would have like uh, like stuff that you wouldn't even know what the hell's happening, and then it's all kind of sitting in, in inside your company in that sense. Yeah, no. So that's what kept me up at night is how we're gonna make sure uh, we make the right choice there. So it's not just for the company coming in, but it's also from us. Uh, how we're gonna make sure yeah, that yeah. Uh, so, we know enough. Uh, this is, so one obvious question I have is, would, would it have been easier to run PHP Explorer not under the PHP umbrella? As, as, like, from out, like, you know, like Skunk Works kind of set up like outside? Would, would it have been easier to do it that way? Possibly. Um, we thought about that. And actually, we thought about other things uh, as well, uh, like bringing in Coinbusters. Uh, that initially was the intent of the program. Um, what we realized is that uh, this year we want to prove the concept that there is a market out there that needs uh, of the program um, because that uh, that's the way we went we had a lot of uh, on our plate just to to create the the enough network and market uh, to to see if there, there was a need in a niche we could play so i think then uh, as we move forward uh, then we can think a different option and perhaps we can go back and look at uh, could it be run outside it's too small my mind is that it is too small today to run it outside of the company it's just too small. If we create, if we create like a, a portfolio of accelerators, so they're looking at different things and not just mineral exploration, maybe. But as it is today, it's too small because I'm leveraging uh, a lot of uh, skills from other parts of the company. I don't have uh, lawyers reporting to me. I don't have a supply reporting to me. I, I don't have a, a large. I have a very small team, and that's because I can benefit of uh, borrowing uh, from wherever I need. Yeah, okay, that makes total sense. So at the end of our interview, we always ask our guests two questions. So the first one is, uh, uh, what is something that you think needs to die in kind of mining or mineral exploration? So it could be an idea, a concept, a behavior of people that you think we need to jettison out of the industry. Oh, behavior. It's always about behavior. You can work everything else, but the behavior has to die. And uh, the behavior is uh, to really waste the capital for uh, stuff that should never see the sunlight uh, just stop the behavior yeah. be more yeah. you're not gonna make any you're not gonna make any friends by no, saying that, Sonia, so, so that, that that's good <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good and so uh, okay so conversely what is something uh again can be an idea concept or behavior that you think we have to keep in uh mining or mineral exploration something that we should not forget but it's like fundamental to our dna so Actually, I no, I don't have something that is fundamental to our DNA we should keep. I think it's a new DNA that needs to be brought in and which is uh, stop to be insular and start to work problems from an industry point of view and sharing more. Um, sharing, uh, it's uh, not uh, dis- disrupting a competitive advantage, but it's actually making each company better. The more you can share, the better it is. And work problem solution as an industry not as individuals excellent we haven't had that one before that's a great one probably a pretty good spot to end on so thanks a lot for joining us Sonia this was great this is a great chat <laughs> thank you so much for having me and thanks a lot for uh, for the very good and pointy question it was a lot of fun I really hope next year you invite me again and we're going to talk about the flashy su- success of Explorer and all the great things we've done in the last year hey we we have 52 episodes a year to fill so you're welcome to come back anytime <laughs> you want so, yeah it's an open invitation for you to come back anytime that's perfect and i'd love to do that absolutely more than happy to share uh, our experiences thanks again for coming on sonia this is great really appreciate it thanks a lot uh, and thanks for having me and why did you want to run an ad on our podcast? You know, we see it as um, it's a different avenue. We didn't want to do the same thing. We didn't want to run an ad with a really annoying limerick or something. Yeah, we wanted to do something that firstly supported something in WA and also something that created content. As I said, I've listened to podcasts, you know, hundreds of podcasts in cars, on journeys, planes, around the field, rock chipping, mapping, whatever it is. And podcasts are a great way to make that day just go a little bit quicker. We want to be a part of that. Hopefully they remember us because of whatever episode you've produced.
In general, you know, we provide people, geos, field staff, we do some off-siders as well. We're providing vehicles and we still up upgrade those as well for exploration. So, that, you know, we fit them with long-range tanks so the guys aren't having to worry about, you know, how much fuel they've got. We want to be there and provide everything. We just want to make their lives easy. You want to be the bunnings of exploration and Yeah, any, anytime, anywhere, you know. Hi, I'm Seamus Murphy. I'm General Manager of Anytime Exploration Services and you're listening to Exploration Radio. We would like to thank Sonia for coming on our show and to Sean Jeffrey for putting this together and to you all for listening. Exploration Radio is brought to you by the Australian Institute of Geoscientists, One to One Group and the Assay. Exploration Radio is also an official media partner of the 2023 PDAC conference. Until next time, let's keep exploring.